Hi everyone, it's Jerry. Let's have a look at a game that was played on July 3rd, 2021. So it was played just a few days ago at leechess.org's Blitz Titled Arena. Uh, this was a three hour event of three minute chess, an event I normally would have liked to cover on Twitch, but I was unable to make that happen. And uh, I really picked a good one to miss out on, said sarcastically, of course. Carlson had a remarkable performance. He ended up setting three records. Uh, the game I'm about to share with you was his 30th consecutive win. That's how he started the event, 30 wins in a row. That was a record. So too was his 94% win rate in the event. And the rating he achieved after winning this game right here set a highest blitz rating ever on leechess.org. What's the number? 3,136. Wrap your head around that figure. It's a big one. Um, feel free to share what your highest blitz rating is. Uh, that's a, that's a remarkable number. Uh, so let's dive in here and see how he got to 3136. First of all, who's who? Carlson's playing the white pieces under the account Dr. Nickterstein. His opponent, Grandmaster Alexer 81. Uh, who's that? We don't know. They're an anonymous Grandmaster. Uh, something I can share, however, about Alexer 81 is that they're a fantastic blitz player. I say this from firsthand experience. I've had the opportunity to play against Alexer 81 about a few dozen times. And, well, their high blitz rating of 2,955 speaks for itself. Okay, what's happening in this game? Not a whole lot. Fairly non-confrontational, minimal tension in the early going, some pressure on the knight, big deal. These last two moves by white, knight to d2, rook e1, are doing what? Preparing a pawn break so that the rooks can finally see the world, see the enemy's side of the board. It's important for black to eliminate this pawn. Uh, if it's allowed to go to e5, it's too valuable for white. Eliminating, uh, taking over control of f6 is disruptive, of course, to the knight and maybe the bishop and other knight who may want to make use of that square as well one day. Okay, it's got to go. So captures away on e4. And if you look at the stockfish evaluation, it's going to basically always tip in white's favor somewhat from this position. And I believe it's primarily looking at uh, the imbalance in the center. White has a fourth rank pawn, black has a third rank. Okay, nothing substantial though for either side. Nothing substantial for white. Queens are now in tension. With this last move, white is also now out of a pin. And so the knight is ready to jump in and improve on e5 with a punch and maybe begin to start to intersect some on the e6 and f7 structures. We could start drawing some lines and this, this structure can maybe start to become a bit sensitive and vulnerable to tactics, right? Wherever there are intersections, just like cars, accidents are nearby. Okay, this is a blitz game. Quick decisions are made. Black doesn't want to even cope with the knight on e5 and says, I'll give you the bishop pair. Show me how you break down my position. Okay, rook d8, small improvement with king to g2. Black initiates the exchange. White is ever so slightly helped because of that decision. It's nice to have the rook on the half open file. The fact that white has doubled B pawns should not be seen as a liability for white. It remains super solid, uh, nice and compact for white without serious weakness. A6, H4. I've kind of skimmed through these first 17 moves. It's a 40 move game, but this is the moment I'd like to draw attention to. 
this next decision by next decision by black is important and i'd like to throw first of all a pop quiz your way uh let's say you're playing as black what move would you play here feel free to pause the video okay uh the move played in the game is knight to d5 now what i'm about to say next is going to sound really ridiculous super bold but i'll do it anyway i think that knight to d5 is a losing move now if you stare at your favorite chess engine uh you're going to see numbers that basically say jerry you're ridiculous it's not winning for white and i get that i realize that it, you know that's somewhat of an exaggeration but let me share some of my thoughts here first of all you know this event again is something that i normally would have uh you know covered live on twitch and i'd upload the whole three hours to youtube i didn't get a chance to do that so i thought to myself you know let's at least check out one of his games one of the games i was drawn to of course was the 30th game the one that set the record i thought to myself that'd be fun let's just see how he got the record you know 31 36 awesome but to my surprise, I actually ended up walking away from this game learning a thing or two. Uh, I didn't really expect that. I, you know, it's just a Blitz game. What can you really pull away from a Blitz game? All right. What can I add to this position? I'd like to, I'd like to focus on this moment here. I think this is a super instructional moment here and uh, one that you can improve. You, you, you could be an improved chess player from. So here we go. Uh, I believe that allowing white to position his pawn on h5, which was white's reply here, will enable white to create a desirable pawn break on the king side, a pawn break that will extend the scope of his rooks in a favorable way. Now, I know that that's a mouthful, but let, let, me, let me be a little bit more uh, precise here. Let, let, me, let me point out some additional things. Uh, first of all, the rooks, the white rooks, if you just look at them quickly, you'll say some may say to themselves, they're doing, they're doing, they're on half open files. They're, they're working. They're not working. That's not good enough in this position type. Uh, there are rooks in this position uh, three half open files. Let's look at them. What do they all have in common? Let, let's look at the points they're observing. What do these three points all have in common? What's something we can say? Well, they're all rock solid. They're secure. They're watched over by a pawn. Neither side is inconvenienced by the fact that these rooks are on half open files and putting pressure on these pawns. They're solid. An additional pawn break must surface in order for the rook's presence to truly be felt in this position. Once one side can bring it to a point where a rook is exerting pressure on a pawn, and let's say that pawn needs the support of a piece, not a pawn, then there's now an inconvenience in the position. There's a defender that cannot do some other stuff let's say so a pawn break is necessary is what i'm getting at and it is extremely important in my opinion that black not make the move knight to d5 but rather h5 i believe that it is super important to have this ram structure these two instances of fixed pawns pawn on h4 black pawn on h5 uh if it's allowed where white has a pawn on h5 versus the pawn on h6, this difference matters. This means that white will be able to push forward on the king side and not create any serious weaknesses along the way. What do I mean by this? Well, let me just say that after these moves are played, after we get to this position right here, what white ends up playing is bishop to d1 what's what's the idea there it's just a get out of the way 
type of move, a clearance move. The F pawn needs to contribute. This guy needs to go here. This guy needs to go here. And then white is what? A step away from creating a pawn break on the king side with maybe F5 or G5. Now, if we go back and try this same method of advancing the F pawn when there's this guy here, let's say this, and let's say this is played, and now we have this plan, F4, not the same. Not the same. Why? G4 as a whole. Look at the grip black would have over the G4 square. It is, in short, not so clear how white breaks down, uh, how white would create a successful pawn break on the king side if there's a black pawn on H5. The fact that black allows a white pawn on H5, well, we're going to see a nice pawn roller surface now on the king side for white. Black doesn't want to see this pawn get any further, by the way. Getting to h6 will be disruptive as well. So, okay, h6 by black. b4 and king to f8. You know, I was saying just a little bit ago, it's a losing move, that knight to d5 move. Okay, I get that that's somewhat of a, an exaggeration. I think something you, you may find it a bit easier to agree with me, uh, something you may find it a little bit easier to agree with me on is that black will not be able to really improve his position uh, so easily. These next nine moves, in fact, by black are basically passing moves. The pieces are just kind of shuffling. The structure changes not at all because there isn't a good way to, you know, I'm talking about pawn breaks for white. If we try and look at from black's perspective, how does black create a pawn break that's going to help his position doesn't exist. There's no pawn move here that's helping black out. Okay, so black has to take this sit and wait approach, which is just a recipe for, you know, you're, you're just ready to lose the game if you just have the sit and wait, wait approach. White is slowly making improving moves. Black is just you know, working behind his structure, like this move right here, you know, rook on e8 to f8, those are never, uh, those are never fun moves to play. A uh, rook that's going from a closed file to a closed file. Same story here, closed file to a closed file. I mean, is there any guarantee that the e file or the f file will be opened up? There isn't. You know, are those moves going to be justified? It's not clear. It's unlikely. Um, it's much, much easier for white to play. I mean, everything is really tipping in white's favor here. King position, rook position, space, bishop pairs, uh, potential pawn breaks. That's, that's the big thing here. White has the ability to create a pawn break, and black has this, yeah, I have to sit and wait. So we're seeing that with king to d8, just back and forth. Pawn break finally hits. We have some tension. It took us a while. We're at move 28, but here we are. If black continues to sit and wait with, let's say, going back here, uh, I mean, here's one way. I'm not 100% on this, but this looks uh, pretty appealing to take on h6 and maybe play f5. All right, what's this doing? Well, we're, we're creating more pawn breaks. And this bishop has an eye on the h6 square. That's looking pretty promising. So what is black's reply here? He goes with f5. And the reply here is g takes f on Passan. Uh, there's a nice little tactical sequence here that my, uh, newest, my newest friend pointed out to me, Stockfish14. Uh, I'd like to share this one with you. Uh, this move right here, c4, is actually there. And uh, it seems on, you know, at first glance, well, isn't that dropping a pawn? Well, here's the follow-up. Bishop to b3, I should have pointed out sooner. When f5 is played, yeah, e6 is a bit more vulnerable. One less defender around for e6, and white is, with this variation, keying in on this point. The threat here is c5, and what is it not doing? 
hitting the bishop, cutting the defense of the knight, and adding additional fuel to the pawn on e6. There really is not a good solution here for black. Uh, I'm not even sure what to suggest. If you back up, trying to get out of this threat, well, that's going to drop e6. Is there any other try? Here, there's c5. These two are hit. Uh, the computer's pointing out some uh, knight move into d3. Um, you can move the rook. And then this is still a threat. These ideas are a threat. It's a big problem for Team Black still. Okay. The approach here by Carlson isn't one to, you know, you, you don't really have to calculate that kind of variation. You could still take this, you know, controlled approach to the position. He takes on f6. His focus is on doing something on the king's side, creating some target potentially on h6. Takes on f6. Plays f5, an additional pawn break. I was pointing out that the rooks are helped once the pawn breaks are in, but so too is uh, this great positive, this bishop pair. So lines are opening up. White is the side benefiting because of these breaks. And now the g pawn is a target. We have the rook backing off. And this next move here, I believe it took about six seconds to play this last move, king to g4. And, you know, you have to quickly calculate uh, a couple lines here. You have to know that uh, you're not going to get hurt after pawn captures pawn. And it may seem appealing, right? Ah, you're in check. I'm going to get your unprotected rook. But white would be able to meet this move, which was not played in the game. He would be able to meet that move with captures and a check right back at black. And if rook takes bishop first, there would be this in-between move, and only then the capture of the rook. White is up the exchange in this position, or after that variation. So there is no capture on f5. Let's see how this one ended up finishing. We have e5. Another break with f6. Pulling away the defender of h6. If this guy is a runner, uh, this knight is not going to have a fun time tracking him down. A knight has to work overtime to track down a passed rook pawn. Okay. Bishop f5 check. Knight e6. White takes that pawn. Gets out of the way of the passer. And this knight is in a pin on e6, so... Black gets out of that, but now we just have a couple more moves. After chopping away on e5, white can actually play what move here? We're just a couple moves away from the end of this game. How does Carlson finish this one? Forcing his opponent to resign in just a couple moves. Feel free to pause the video. Okay, here we go. Rook takes bishop. And after pawn takes rook, Rook takes knight, and black says, I've had enough. R throws in the towel at this stage. No hope here for black. If he takes the rook, these guys are too much. Black king is out of, the, out of position. Even if it was in a better position, it would still be losing. This is uh, completely winning for white. Let's, let's put on some moves if, let's say, this is how it continued. Rook trying to get behind the pawn, marches. And we can have white following with something like that. Bishop g5. Preparing to cut the rook off, and we're just two steps away from promotion land. But it goes no further after rook takes knight. This game is over. Alexer 81 resigns, and with that we have Carlson setting uh, a new highest blitz rating ever. Again, just one of three records he ended up setting for this event, so... Again, this was a game I only intended to share. I thought it would just be fun and, yeah, somewhat surprised that I, I took something away from this 3-0 game. I guess that's what's possible when the, the champ, the doctor, ends up playing in these events. Still things to learn from uh, these brief games. Anyhow, I hope you maybe took a thing or two away from this one. Uh, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback in the comment section below. Hope you're having a great day, and I'll catch you in the next video. That's all for now. Take care.